Hello, historians. This is Mr. Fredo. If you want to talk about the world as we know it and what it has to do with our class, 7th grade world studies at John C. Dempsey Middle School in Delaware, Ohio, look no further than the Columbian Exchange, one of the coolest topics that we'll look at this year in terms of the difference that it makes. So in general, we got to go way back in time to understand the significance here. Many of you have heard of this Pangea or Pangea, this supercontinent, massive landmass in which all of the different continents that we know throughout the world today were all connected. And when this existed, that meant all of these territories, it was really one territory, had the same fauna, the animal life, had the same flora, plant life, had the same types of uh, creatures and, and, and pathogens uh, prevalent all, all, of, uh, all over it. Well, over time, because of different factors like erosion and, and other climatic issues, that supercontinent starts to split apart over the course of millions and millions and millions of years. This isn't in the blink of an eye until we get to our present day layout. But what the Columbian Exchange means is, as soon as the Columbian Exchange gets rolling in 1492 with Columbus's quote-unquote discovery, it's the first time that these two halves of the world had in, have interacted in any significant way in over 250 million years. And as soon as this happens, the world as we know it is never the same again. A few things to understand about the Columbian Exchange. Number one, it is wide open. There is no set plan. The triangular trade, which we've talked about before and we'll talk about again in next week's episode, that was a very strict, regimented process. Step one, step two, step three. The Columbian Exchange is very messy. It's nonstop. It's ongoing. It's constant. That means anyone and everyone could be involved, whether it was intentional or unintentional. And also another key point, it's still happening today, perhaps even more so than ever before because of current technology that allows two sides of the world to interact in any number of ways aside from just traveling. Okay, So the Columbian Exchange really breaks down into three main types of exchanges. Fauna, the exchange of animal life, meaning turkeys for the first time ever going from the new world to the old world. Uh, or in the case of a new world exchange, it could be horses arriving in the new world for the first time ever. This is critical to understand. These exchanges that you're looking at, what they mean is as a result of Columbus's quote-unquote discovery in 1492, it's the first time in millions of years that any of these species or anything like it could have come in contact with the other side. So imagine what a difference horses are going to make in the new world in terms of travel. Imagine what turkeys are going to do in terms of a food source in Europe. Those are examples of fauna, animal life. In terms of plant life, flora, tobacco is taken from the new world to the old world. That's going to cause a business craze, um, a cultural craze, and it's also going to cause eventually some very significant health problems. Same thing goes from the other side, grapes being brought over to the new world for the first time ever. And then, of course, pathogens. This is mostly one way, but European diseases that they had built up an immunity to um, unknowingly being brought over and absolutely devastating populations throughout the new world. And that's another key point to understand. Some of these exchanges were intentional. Europeans designed bringing horses over. They absolutely wanted to take tobacco back. Some of them were unintentional. The Europeans didn't know that they were a walking time bomb ready to carry smallpox or typhus or influenza over to the new world. It was so wide open and it was so widespread and so constant could have been completely unintentional or it could have been planned out. 